Hello, my name is Irina, and here I am with Professor Mark Kassen, Professor of Economics from the University of Reading, who agreed to take part in this interview. Thank you, Mark, for doing this recording with me. Professor Mark Kassen is a professor of economics, and this channel is about international business, innovation, strategy. Of course, uh, economics is a part of that, but I would like to ask Professor Kassen, how did you arrive? to the field of international business and became a co-author of the major international business theory, which is internalization theory. By accident, basically. Um, when I was looking for a job, um, I was fortunate that one of my teachers had got themselves a professorship at Reading. So when I wrote to ask them for a job reference, they said, I can do even better than that. I might be able to have a job. And uh, a lot of people think that if you went to Reading, you would be interested in international business. But I was hired to teach econometrics. And the first course I actually taught was the worst course in the department. It was remedial mathematics for economics. And I taught that course for 20 years. So my research interest in international business, I was only stimulated about four years after I joined Reading when my good friend Peter Buckley turned up from Lancaster University on a one-year research fellowship working with John Dunning. And we became friends. And we you know, go for a drink together and we started arguing. We started arguing about Peter's crazy ideas about international business and why, from an economic perspective, they were obviously wrong. And uh, out of that developed a dialogue, which continued when we went on holiday. Uh, and we spent the whole two week holiday going to Budapest and back, arguing about economics of international business. When we got back, we both wrote up our own versions of what we decided, which didn't agree. Um, and then we knocked them together into a book. And that was basically how it happened. Um, so I never really taught international business. I mean, people should realize I don't do teaching in international business because at Reading, there's lots of people who teach international business. They don't need me to teach it as well. So although I run a masterclass uh, once a year, that's about the limit of my teaching on international business. The rest of the teaching is mainly in micro, macro and economic history. So that's how I got involved. And uh, to some extent, I still pop in and out of the subject. So recently, I, this year, I pub published a book. There's nothing to do with international business. It's about the medieval town of Cambridge. So, um, you know, I, I sort of, I think it's, a, it's an advantage, actually, to some extent, to have several strings to your bow, because it gives you a perspective on the subject. And I can see international business in a perspective that's probably different from other people's, because my background is not somebody who always wanted to study the subject. I just got involved in it uh, by accident. Thank you. I also think that to some extent, um, to me at least, I can say that you, are, you were one of those who founded the field with the internalization theory and popularized it. And uh, we now study internalization theory as a major uh, element of any IB course. Some of the discussions that we have uh, in the class are re revolving around globalization and international business. From your perspective, what is the difference between these two concepts? Well, I agree that they're used interchangeably. To me, they're completely different. Um, to me, globalization is a movement that we've seen since 1945 up to perhaps about before Donald Trump and Brexit. Um, and it was also a movement um, in the late 19th century too, to some extent, when it was actually called imperialism, probably more than globalization at that time. Um, and we've seen other periods of history, um, such as the age of discovery, when um, People sailed out from ports in Spain, Portugal, Italy, uh, Holland and England to discover new parts of the world um, and to develop trade with other continents. So globalization is something that's happened at various phases of history. 
And to me, it has actually five elements. Um, I do actually lecture on the subject of globalization. So uh, from my point of view, there are five elements to it. One is basically free trade, which is basically reducing tariffs, but also reducing non-tariff barriers by agreeing on standard definitions of products and agreeing on uniform regulations about how they're produced and how they're to be used. So there's trade, then there's technology, um, the ability of people to, in the recent years, speak a fairly common language, namely English, which becomes the language to some extent of science. Science develops as an international community through a university system. And the university system, to some degree, is just a secular version of the old Roman Catholic Church and its monasteries and abbeys. Um, so there's a diffusion of knowledge. Then there is the movement of capital, the ability to raise money in big financial centers like London, New York, Amsterdam, uh, whatever, and then deploy that financial resource to undertake risky projects in, in very distant countries. Fourthly, there's movement of labor. Um, and there's always been movement of labor, um, both for reasons of political persecution, threat of starvation, civil war on the one hand, but also economic opportunism. And economic opportunism has been very important because economic migration is typically by entrepreneurial individuals who are ambitious and who want to go where the market is and where they can get access to the capital. So they migrate to where the action is, as it were, and they create a bigger critical mass of action in these places where the action is. So migration is very, very important, I think, in taking ambitious people to centers where they feel they can thrive. And then finally, there's who's in control of all of this, who coordinates it. And we have really two systems. One are um, international treaties to deal with the political side of things. But the multinational corporation is an international coordination mechanism in the private sector. So the multinational enterprise, you know, it coordinates all these activities being financed, transferring technology, exploiting resources in different parts of the world. But the multinational is just one part of this. It's my contention, you can't understand it properly unless you understand the whole picture. And one of the problems with international business studies is it tries to lift the multinational enterprise out of context and then say, oh, look at this, it's how curious, it's a funny firm. It operates across national borders. Let's have a look at, at what its environment is like. But the, the multinational enterprise is a product of its environment. If the word technology is being developed, if there weren't opportunities for trade, if there wasn't any capital available, there wouldn't be any multinational enterprise. And the big problem with international business studies is that it, it's narrowed its focus over time to become effectively a theory of how you manage a multinational in order to extract as much profit as you can from the customers and to avoid too much interference from government. And I'm afraid that's the path to nowhere, because that is really trying to pretend that you can solve, address big problems and big issues like globalization through a very, very narrow focus on one particular aspect of it. Thank you. A multinational enterprise is a product of its environment. What I, I find important that uh, space and geography or economic geography uh, they play an important role in, in international business. Can you perhaps talk a bit more about this? Well, I'd like to split that into two questions, I think. The first is what's the role of geography? And the second is what can we specifically say about geography? So what's the role of geography? I wouldn't give it quite the degree of priority, I think, that you do. Um, I'm interested to some extent in why we have big firms. Where do big firms come from? Are they born big or do they grow big? And although there are lots of examples of relatively small 
on global firms, most firms do grow big, some grow very quickly, so we don't notice the growth phase very much. Often we only recognize the firm as an object of study when it has grown big. Uh, but I think if we look at the growth of firms, we can see that very often there is somebody, some person or group of people who believe they've identified an opportunity in the sense that somebody they know has a problem, but they think they've got an answer to it. So the problem might be for a lot of people who feel that their appearance would be improved a lot um, and that they could be more influential if they uh, looked better. That's a market for clothing, for cosmetics, for, for, for people who have those needs. So you think we can do better than existing products in fulfilling that basic need. Or it might be that people want to have fast food, but have healthy fast food. So that could be another market niche. So effectively, I would say that, that the rationale of any firm, but particularly a, a successful multinational firm, is spotting some kind of unsolved problem that a significant group of people have. And if those people are all over the world, if it's, it's common across cultures, then there's a market there. But then immediately the management issue becomes, why don't other people, why haven't other people thought of this first? So one problem is um, you go along and say, I've got this brilliant idea, that everybody wants this. And you go to a bank and say, give me a loan. And everybody says, you're rubbish. If it was a good idea, somebody else would have thought about it, not you. So actually getting finance is a big problem if you want to grow fast. If you want to grow fast, you've got to borrow. You can't just wait for the profits to come in and then reinvest them. And the point is, if you can't grow fast, somebody else will see you're doing well and they'll have access to more money and they'll steal your idea and they'll go and make all the money out of it instead. But particularly if it's based on a new technology. For new technology, you want patent protection. But then you have to hire very expensive patent lawyers to protect your patent. Because if people know you've got a patent, but know you can't afford the lawyers, they just infringe your patent on the grounds that you can't afford to take us to court so we can get away with it. So you've got to manage that. Then you've got to get your message across to your customers. So you've got to market the product. Um, I could go on, but I think, uh, you know, recruitment of suitable staff, delegation of responsibilities, all of that, I think it's pretty obvious. What I'm talking about is the growth of a firm. And when you've got large, the defense of your market against emerging rivals who are trying to eat away at the fringes of your market by coming up with new ideas of their own about how they can improve on your offering and take your trade away from you. So I would say that there's a fundamental kind of mega entrepreneurial dynamic to the firm, which is to some extent quite independent of the location choices. So I would then see the location choice as being itself an entrepreneurial decision, because what you want to do basically is to set your production plants down in positions which will be good, not only to service present demands, but to service demands that you think may develop in the future. You may want, to, as you know from your own work, to think about flexible locations. Um, and of course, in some industries, nowadays, the plant isn't something that's totally immovable. It's basically a bunch of robots stuck inside a big warehouse. And that is a much more footloose kind of operation. So you certainly need a location strategy, but I, don't, I wouldn't prioritize location strategy as being the, the, the one big thing that managers to think about. Um, the problem for multinationals is that there are threats and opportunities on multiple fronts. And it's actually, I think, finding an organization which is able to deal with these multiple threats effectively, that, that is the major challenge uh, there. So in terms of location, I think it's one of a number of issues that firms face. Um, 
in terms of location itself, I mean, I think that it really is a bit of a poor relation in some cases to other subjects within the international business domain, and that possibly much more attention than is necessary is maybe sometimes paid to marketing, but too little, say, to uh, location and logistics. I do think it's interesting um, to look at where plants, manufacturing plants in particular, are located, uh, because typically they're located you know, in coastal regions. Um, and the question is, why do we find certain parts of the world that are sort of heavily populated with production units uh, and other parts that aren't. And I always think that coastal regions are literally these sort of liminal areas, people sometimes refer to them as borderlands between sea and land. And, and I think one of the problems that a lot of people have in international business is they don't think in geographical terms, they're aware of location, but they don't relate it to physical geography. Um, I'm particularly interested in the geography of towns and medieval towns in particular. And the question, why is that town there rather than somewhere else, can also be applied, of course, to a production plant. Why is that production plant there rather than somewhere else? Um, and if you'll excuse me, a bit of a digression. Um, if you were to ask why are medieval towns where they are, one answer would be, well, there was a monastery there, there was a saint, there's some sort of holy well there, or some sort of abbey nearby, and it's developed into a sort of cathedral town or city on that basis. Why was that person there? Often because there was a holy well or a spring. It was actually access to fresh water that determined settlement. And today, of course, we pipe water around a lot, so it's not such a big issue. But in medieval times, access to fresh drinking water in abundance and a reliable supply of it was really crucial for settlement. So a lot of settlements are, are dictated by this. And therefore, um, the areas that are on the borderlands of mountains, but where they're entering plains near the sea, are actually quite a good place for settlement. The second thing is, if you're going to produce stuff, how do you move it around? How do you get the raw materials in? How do you get the finished product out? And of course, in an era before decent roads and railways, water was the means of transport. And so the inland transport was the river system and, and the basis of improvements on the river system, which was that gave birth to the early canals. So where do rivers enter the at coastal situations. So actually what you typically find is that manufacturing activity for centuries agglomerated at the first bridging point over major rivers. The first bridging point was where, where the river was sufficiently manageable that you could bank it up. It wasn't in a fast swampy area. And so because you could embank the river, you could build a bridge across it and therefore you could have a settlement. And what happened is that the seagoing vessels would come up to the river port by the bridge. And then there'd be smaller vessels to go on down river inland to distribute the goods. Well, if you're going to take stuff off a ship and then put it onto a smaller ship, you might as well process it to reduce its bulk. So you get a lot of bulk processing. And if you go to any port, almost anywhere in the world these days, you'll see lots of industry around the port, much of which is bulk processing, reducing the volume and increasing the value of the product that's coming by sea and is going to be distributed by land. And that's a fundamental piece of economic geography. And in a way, um, international business hasn't discovered that. I mean, that's always been there. International business has simply fitted into that and possibly reinforced that movement. But so it, my, my, my argument would be, in order to stand location in international business, you need to understand medieval history. 
Thank you very much. You've answered the third question that I had about the economic activities around the coastal area. Yeah. So multinational enterprise is a firm that controls assets in more than one country. That's a standard definition. So the control usually involves the establishment of a subsidiary, for example, that can control the activities in that particular location. So multinationals are very complex and some multinationals may have 400, 600 subsidiaries around the world. It doesn't mean that this number stays the same all the time, but it's sort of a big number. Even 100 subsidiaries is still very, it's still a lot, even 50 is a lot. So how do you, how do you manage the company of this size? What are the major uh, obstacles? Okay, well, there's um, quite a lot of political, philosophical, legal and economic literature on the question of how you coordinate activity within the economic system. And I was familiar with this literature before I ever got interested in the multinational. So when I got interested in the multinational, I, I sort of kind of referred myself to this other literature and just thought, what do these more general principles tell me I should expect to see within a multinational? So if we look at these more general principles, one of the big debates in the 1930s was over capitalism versus socialism or planning versus prices. And um, what some people said was that efficient allocation of resources doesn't really require resources to be privately owned. They could be owned in common, or they could be owned on behalf of the public by the state. Um, all that we need is some sort of information processing system that tells us where scarce resources should be allocated. But a certain amount of land, but a certain amount of labor, if a certain access to certain technologies. So how should we put all this together to meet the needs of the people? in the best possible way. And the answer was to find out what the people want, um, to find out by auditing what resources are available where, and then to match them up using a concept of value, which says each resource should be put to its most valuable use, where value is dictated by the preference of the customers who are going to use the product when it's produced. And this value can be a price, but it doesn't have to be a price at which one person exchanges ownership of a product with another. It can simply be a, a value attached to the product of an enterprise. So in the National Health Service in this country, for example, we could, if we wished, attach values to different kinds of life and values to curing different kinds of ailments. And then we could reward hospitals in terms of value units, um, and they would then use these value units to distribute to their workers, and the health workers would use the value units to spend on other things that have value that have been produced by other people. So you don't actually have to have private enterprise even to do this kind of thing. So if you then think about, well, how is the information handled? You can see that this is one big organization, one great national, state-driven organization. So it's more complicated even than your multinational with its 600 subsidiaries. So what are the issues here then? Well, one of the issues is that the people at the top have no contextual awareness of the millions of people at the bottom and the diversity of the situations they are in. You can send them up messages but how do they understand them if they don't understand the context of the people who sent the message? So one problem is people at the top are out of touch with what goes on at, at the bottom. Second thing is what about responding to disruptions or disasters? The people at the top, who tells them that something is about to go seriously wrong? Who can, who can not only recognize it, we need, if you like, the menial people at the bottom to be alert. Some guy's got to say, I may be just the cleaner 
but I think this boiler is going to explode. Um, and if they don't have the ability to do that, disaster will follow. But then the point is, this information has got to go up the organization to the level where somebody has the authority to decide to do something about it. And the more layers you have in the organization, the slower the process is, and the more people there are who can just sit on the information and do nothing and stop it going up further to the point where some action can be taken. So big organizations tend to be sluggish. And in, in a marketing market context, we can say a multinational that's structured like this will be very slow to react to competitive threats because the people who are recognized as competitive threats are often frontline people salespeople who will be seeing the attitudes of customers towards new products. So a motor car manufacturer should maybe be listening to the opinion of Fred in the sales room, in the Oxford car showroom, who's been told by several, several prospective buyers of the car that they don't like the awful range of colors that are produced. But if that information doesn't get up top, then up people up top don't know exactly what people are really saying in confidence about the new range of cars being produced. So you need therefore to have a small number of layers because every layer in your organization is a point where important information coming up from the front line can get lost. But if you de-layer, that means if you need 600 uh, say outwards, and you de-layer, then you might have a situation where you had say five or six layers because each person at each layer um, organized say 10 people beneath them. And then there were 10 people beneath them and each of them had 10 people beneath them. If you decide that you have fewer layers, then each people report, more people are reporting to someone at every layer. So you might reduce the layers by half, but the span of control would be doubled. So if, for example, my university decides we're not going to have departments anymore because departments are too small units, we need to cut out that layer. You'll now be in a school. So they sweep away the department. The head of department managed 20 people. The head of school manages 100 people. You can't have the same relationship with your head of school as you had with your head of department before. So the problem with delayering is that the personal relationship um, is lost, really. So you have to have more formal procedures. Well, formal procedures usually dictate the form in which information has to be presented before it can be accepted by the organization. So people can no longer pass on stuff that doesn't fit the format in which the information has to be provided. So I think you can see that you don't need really to look at the multinational and say, hey, this multinational has lots of subsidiaries, what should it do? There are loads of models, the National Health Service, the Army, the Roman Catholic Church, um, the United Nations, national governments, regional governments, local authorities. They all have a lot of, in common, really. And so I would say, uh, coming back to my earlier point, simply saying I study international business, now I'm going to think about organization. It's the wrong way around. You should be thinking about organization anyway. And you should just know enough about organization, have thought about it enough to say multinational enterprise, oh I can see what that problem is. It's partly this like such and such and it's part of that like such and such. And you use these analogies of metaphors from other types of organization and you apply them selectively to different aspects of the MNE. Um, so instead of having this specialized subject area called headquarters subsidiary relationships, it would be better if people just went away and read up the debates on planning versus prices in the 1930s, because then they'd see that they're just studying one recent manifestation of a generic problem that's bothered people ever since we've had civilized society. There is an interesting conversation that I had with my students and what they say is that there are studies and there is a job market. But 
what they are asking is how to bridge the two. So what are the potential obstacles recent graduates may face and do you have any advice? Um, I can offer some advice, but I'd, my first piece of advice was take advice from lots of different people. In other words, it's not the question of seeking to outsource your decision to some authority figure who will tell you what to do. You do that when you're a child because your parents take your decisions for you. But what you now need to do is to develop a network of people from a wide variety of different backgrounds, not just immediate friends of your own age or whatever, and ask each of those for advice before you take your decision. Then triangulate the advice, note where there is consensus, where there is difference, and then take responsibility for the decision you make as a result. So I will chip in, but not on the basis that I'm telling you what to do, just that I'm one of various people that can offer you opinions on this subject. So I would say that um, you need to differentiate between the job you're going to get, sort of like after graduation, and the job that you really want, your vocation in life. Um, for my generation, vocation was very important and therefore we could, and we could afford to be choosy because the economy was in full employment um, and therefore we faced a very different kind of job market to that that exists today. So I would say that there's a big difference between the job that you hope eventually to get and the job that you can get right away. I put this in an, in, in an academic context, if I may, because that's easiest for me to talk about. So if you wanted to pursue a career in academia, I would say at the moment that any job is a good job because I don't think there are going to be many jobs coming up, good jobs coming up in the next couple of years because the, the finances aren't there to support this. But the scenario in universities is going to be teaching more students with the same number of staff um, and therefore more intensive use of the resources we already have. Um, but that doesn't matter if you can pursue a, a, a strategy of the following. And that is divide your time into really three sections. Manage your time. Try and get a job which will simply give you an income and enable you to survive. And in a university context, that would probably be a teaching assistant or even an administrative role. There are, there are quite a few professors in British universities who began their academic careers as administrators. And they started publishing, and they started publishing more than the research active academic staff. And they finished up as professors. So even if you've got just an administrative job in the admissions department, it's still, it's, still, it's still a job in a university and you can still do research in your own time. You can still socialize with other academics. Uh, you, you will meet students even if you don't teach them. And therefore you can still carry on with your research agenda, even a job of that kind. So don't be too picky about the kind of job or the kind of institution you want to go at. Just if you want to, get an academic job, just keep your hand in, in academia, one way or another, that keeps your options open. Uh, the second thing is, I think these days people don't necessarily want everybody to be a star performer. What they want are people who are reliable, dependable, sociable, accessible. Um, and if you have those qualities, um, people are so relieved, why? because management is very stressful, particularly in the present environment where all sorts of um, new challenges are constantly emerging. The last thing you want if you're a head of department or head of school is a troublesome, time-consuming member of staff who keeps having paddies or hissy fits or getting upset about various things. What you want is people who treat you with respect, you treat them with respect. If you ask them to do something, they agree to do it, you can be 100% sure it will be done on time. So rather than being a star performer and, and being smarter than everybody else, there's a lot to be said for just being plain, reliable, dependable um, and sociable. 
a team player, basically. Uh, and that I can't overstate too much that academic appointments are based on two things, the CV and the interview. And basically, with a CV, even if you don't have a lot on it, um, it may still suggest that you're an industrious person. And many of the jobs just require team players with research potential, not star players with a phenomenal track record of publication. But my final point would be that if you're going to pursue this strategy I've suggested, that is get a job and then make the best, best of it, you've got to use the rest of your time that isn't your job time properly. And that involves really two distinct kinds of research output. One is that if you want to become a researcher in the university, you've got to have like the, the papers on the CV. And I regard that as what I call jobbing research. That is, it's output orientated. What journals are looking for what papers on what topics? What editor briefings can I attend on the internet that will tell me what three or four star journal editor is looking for what kind of paper? And how can I write 8,000 words that will get past the referees? That's not research, that's just career advancement. That is just calculating what other people want to hear and then telling it to them. But the final important point is what about your big idea? Um, what about reading around the subject in the way I've suggested? What about really wacky ideas that everybody tells you is absolute nonsense? Uh, as Irina knows, I've got several wacky ideas that everybody tells me is, are completely unpublishable. Um, and they're my favorite ideas. And eventually they probably finish up in some form being published. But the point is this, one of these wacky ideas could turn into a high impact paper. Sometime in the next 10 years, one of your wacky ideas might appear as a new perspective on a, on a worn out subject. And you suddenly might find yourself precipitated into a professorship because you suddenly emerged as a star performer. Um, so academia is not soccer, but it's a bit like soccer in the sense that one, you've got to be a team player, and two, the star performers emerge in the most improbable ways, often purely almost by accident. But one thing all star performers do have is the fact they believed in themselves. And when other people told them their ideas were daft, they didn't actually say, oh, my idea must be daft because they told me so. They thought, oh, I don't think so. I don't think you've understood it properly because I didn't explain it properly. If I explained it better, I'm sure people would get it. So actually, it's a three-way thing. Get yourself a job and be reliable. Publish as much as you can, just to get the publications, but also cherish that big idea and work on it because one day it might come good. And, and, and you know, it's always nice to have a, a good idea. Not all of them will come good and you may never actually succeed, but at least you'll know that you've spent your time on a worthwhile project. Um, it, it, even if it didn't bring you fame and fortune as a result. Thank you, Mark. Do you have any word of advice for undergraduate students as well? I understand that the second point that you said, being honest, reliable, accessible, that is something that we all can relate to. We all want to work with this kind of people. We all, we all want to be one of those team players. Uh, but what about maybe other two points for, for undergraduate students? who are currently, or will be graduating soon? Uh, the only comment I would, I mean, to, to be honest with you, I mean, with undergraduate students, <clears throat> you don't get to know them in the same way that you mm. get to know the postgrads. So I'm giving advice to people that really, I, I know a lot of them, but I don't know any of them particularly well. Um, but I think the, the main thing I would say to them is you have to be articulate. Um, you have to be able to understand that you are addressing an audience and that if you don't speak up 
and you can't explain your answers or your ideas, then you can't really function in an organization where people have to work as a team. Merely being able to write good essays, to get the right answer to puzzles and problems that are set in class is not the same thing as employability. So employability is to some extent the skills that possibly I've been demonstrating to you in this video, namely the ability to talk in a plausible way, both about things you know about, and also to make up plausible sounding things about things you don't know about. And this, uh, if I have to say one thing that I think limits most undergraduates, is they do not know how to present themselves in an articulate, accessible manner. And that makes people worry that however good a student may be, however clever they may be, they can't work with others. They can't be put into customer facing roles. They may be diffident in team based roles. And, and therefore that I think is a key clue. And just finally, I don't actually think that necessarily doing teamwork as part of course assignments on an undergraduate program actually develops the kind of skills that really matter. The kind of skills that really matter in terms of communication are skills you will develop by joining clubs and societies and getting engaged in social movements, getting part-time jobs as a but when they reopen, you know, as a waiter in Pizza Hut or something, these jobs and these clubs and societies are the fora where you develop your social skills. And, and, and that, I think, would be my main advice. Thank you very much for such valuable advice. And thank you very much for taking your time uh, to record the session with me. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a lot, as usual, from you, Mark. So, so did I. I, I. I really surprised myself with some of the things I said. Thank you very much. And I will see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.